All right. Well, good morning. Again, I'm uh, CWC Mike Mears. With me today is my partner, uh, CWC Dan Schwab. And this is the first of many lectures uh, going into the power circuits and transformers block. Uh, again, this is the first block of the 80 hour um, portion of phase three, electrical systems design. This is probably the most challenging block uh, throughout the entire course. Our students feel like it's the most challenging because it's the first inter introduction and interaction they have with a lot of math and science and electricity, which are all things that people are a little bit rusty on. Um, so first and foremost, let's, uh, let's dive right in. I want to show you our primary reference for this is going to be this lab bolt manual here. It's about, I don't know what you say, like half inch thick half inch thick uh, power circuits and transformers. You can find a digital copy of this on the blackboard uh, in the theory learning module. Also, uh, I've cut these sections down by units, one through nine, and put those into the learning modules as well. It's for download and printing, makes it a little bit easier. Uh, each day is a unit in here, and by the time we're done with week two, we'll have gone through this entire book here. You would have done everything that's in this book. All right, so, First and foremost, we go to unit one, because this is day one, all right? And the first thing that we're going to be working on is fundamentals of electrical power technology, all right? So that's unit one, unit one, all right? So what's your experience with electricity? You've been out in the field for a while, and so... Uh, Capital generation and uh, taxable distribution at the battalion slash brigade level. Okay, so... Have you had to do many calculations? Uh, just basic load calculations as far as what our demand is and, um, and what our brigade's demand is, so that way we can ensure that we have adequate number of generator generation for the field. So that's really good. So basic load calculations. I like how you put that too, basic. What was the basic formulas that you used for those load calculations? P equals IE. You know. P equals IE, that's one. What was the other one? Amps, watts, demand, P equals IE, this is all good stuff. And I like how he said that it's, it's basic stuff, because it absolutely is. It's very, very basic calculations. In order for it to be basic, though, you have to be rehearsed, and you kind of have to understand what those things are. All right? So first and foremost, let's talk about what electricity actually is. Well, we can break down electricity um, into kind of its fundamental units. We talked a little bit on our lab bolt intro on some of those units, uh, one being a volt, right? The volt, uh, we talked about the amp or the ampere, representative current, and then the ohm, which is the amount of resistance. All right, another thing that we're gonna talk about when you alluded to power would be the watt, which is a unit of power, all right? So really kind of one of the simplest ways to understand electricity and power and kind of internalize it is to go back to what I mentioned in that, that intro video about water. All right, water's a really easy way to understand it, okay? So let's think of a, let's think of a, a, a water hose all right, or a water system, or you know, whatever you want to, whatever you want to internalize that with. All right, and let's talk about the actual water pressure. Okay, the amount. Now you remember you teach phase two. What's what's a roughly psi you're looking for inside of a building? To you're looking for a minimum of twenty psi. Minimum twenty psi. Okay, so we want twenty psi, and that psi is the actual pressure of water going to our end users. Correct. Okay. Okay, so now, again, to correlate this back to phase two and, and water distribution, um, we think of voltage as that pressure. That's the, the amount of pressure we're actually getting out there to our end users. Okay, now let's think about uh, what are those calculations that you have where you put a bend in a pipe or you put an elbow and you put a those, and what does that do to the water flow? Every little piece that you in, introduce into your water system what is it effectively doing to that PSI? So it's effectively lowering, lowering the PSI. Um, any turn, any enlargement in the pipe, you're reducing, you're reducing the pressure that goes through the pipe. It's restricting the flow of water, correct? Okay. okay, so that restriction that we're seeing from different fittings and different valves and different elbows, that can be looked at in the electrical system as resistance, okay? And, and hence the name, resistance. It's resisting that flow. Resistance is the opposition of current flow, okay? So what is current then? What would it, if, if, if the PSI is voltage, 
and the resistance is all that thing stopping, uh, limiting the flow, right, through the system, what is current then in our analogy? What do you think? Um, I would say probably the amount being put in, amount of the pipe, the amount, amount of the water that's being pushed through the pipe. The water, <laughs> the, yes, the water, the amount would be the quantity of said, yeah. you know, uh, current. However, the water itself going through that is, uh, you know, effectively the current. Okay, so we talked about voltage, current, and resistance. Voltage being that pressure, that PSI pushing. All right, current being the actual water, the thing you're trying to get to your end users, trying to shower up with that current, right? And uh, and then resistance being those things that's opposing, opposing the flow of current into that circuit or opposing water flowing through your system. Okay, that's a very, very good way of seeing it. If you look on the slides uh, that are in the blackboard, you're going to see a cool little picture that shows these, you know, little cartoon characters, and it shows voltage is this dude, he's back there pushing, right? And then you see resistance is this guy with this lasso choking up on this other guy, right? And current is the thing that's just in the middle, you know, getting pushed one way and pulled another way, okay? So that's a good visual representation of those three main elements, three main elements that we need to know to kind of understand um, what current flow is, okay? What, what electricity is, all right? So let's back up a little bit. Um, how much do you know about, um, let's say, some, some atomic structure? What are the, what are the fundamentals of like a, a thing, an atom? Like what do they have? Cells, nucleus. Nucleus, what else? There's, there's these three things that are going on in there, you don't remember? No. We've got a, a proton. Uh, a neutron. And, a and what's that last one? Uh, put me on the spot, I don't know. The electron, man. Uh, yeah, it's like the most important one, the electron, all right? So the electron is that, uh, that negatively charged thing that's out there, right? Uh, living uh, inside of the, the structure of an atom, okay? And when we actually talk about electricity, we're not actually creating electrons. We're not making electrons. Essentially what we're doing is we're using an electric field to push and pull electrons through other materials, all right? And so uh, material science plays a huge role in electricity. All right, because there are certain things, certain materials that uh, have these valence electrons. They got these electrons that are out there in the orbit. They're on the <coughs> outer layer of that material, right? And by inducing some type of external force to that, it allows them to easily be released and pushed and travel on to the next atom. And they just keep doing that. And they just keep traveling. You, you create enough force and you move the electrons. All right, so electricity is that flow of electrons. Okay, and so back to material science, you have certain things that uh, readily give up those electrons. They readily let them move. It's very easy. And we can think of this as magnets, right? So I've got these, let me, let me come over here and grab these magnets. I love magnets, right? Because well, one, electrical engineering, magnetism is like a big part of that, right? All right, so you hold that magnet there. All right, so do you feel any force there? You don't feel anything, right? Right? But as I get a little closer, you feel anything? I get a little closer, you really feel it, right? Okay, so that, that, that external force that I'm putting on there is uh, very similar to uh, when you create an um, a magnetic field and you create an electric field. You can push electrons, move them, create a force that is going to allow the flow of electrons. All right, so what are the most common... Oh, goodness. Let's edit that out. Let's, uh, what are the most common um, conductors that actually allow the free flow of electrons that you can think of? Copper, aluminum. Uh, There's a third one that's like super, super good. It's just expensive. Uh, I don't know. The third gold. One. Oh, yeah, gold. Yeah. So copper and aluminum um, being the best ones, right? So because of the, the, the material science in there, it allows the free flow of those electrons through them, right? So they make good conductors. Conversely, we have things called insulators that stop the flow of electrons. They do not allow the flow of electrons through them. That would be an insulator. So conductor lets those things go. Insulators puts a halt to them. Okay. Uh, and as an example, let's think of it like this. So right here, we called this earlier, this was a conductor, right? We're going to use it as a conductor. However, when I touch it, I'm not, there's not electrons flowing through this part right here because this outer shell is an insulator, it's insulating. It's insulating you from the actual conductor, which is probably aluminum or copper on the inside of these, right? Inside of here is the conductor, allowing the free flow of electrons from here to here. This becomes that, that path 
from the voltage source to the load, current flowing through electricity, but the material, this plastic or whatever it is, is an insulator and it's stopping, right? It's keeping you electrically isolated, not allowing those electrons to flow to you. It's flowing through here. All right. Okay, so we talked about uh, the volts. You know, that's the pressure, right? The PSI. Then we talked about the resistance. That's that choking. That's that restriction. Those are the bins in our pipe. And then we talked about the water itself, which is the current flow going to the end user. All right. And electricity is, is essentially just flowing those electrons through. So you create that current flow to actually get it to the end user, the load. Okay. All right. Now, one of the primary, primary, you mentioned P equals IE. In electrical theory and electrical science, there's a plethora of, you know, calculus formulas, differentials, integrals, and all that stuff. But you can base exactly what you need to know for this course down to two simple formulas. Two formulas. That's it. What do you think they are? You already mentioned one of them. Uh, what? Formula. Okay, you said P equals I E. Everybody likes pi, right? That's an easy one. And then the other one is, you remember? Okay. Give you a hint. Ohm's law. Oh, shit. <laughs> e equals I R. E equals I R. Look, see, it's very, very basic. E equals I R. Okay. Put me on the spot. I know. <laughs> I know. So, everything that we're going to be talking about and a majority of the math that we're going to be doing, it's all going to go back to those two formulas right there. All right. Now, you'll see in the slide deck that I put this cool little graphic in there. And that graphic has the circle that you see on the, the cover of the uglies and some other things. It's got all these little circle charts, right? And you see all these different formulas. There's all these cool little ways. If I'm looking for this, I do this. I absolutely hate that. I put it there in case it helps you learn. But you don't need to know any of that. You need to know three things. Formula one, formula two, and what's the third thing? What do you think? Algebra. That's all you need, right? Algebra. Okay. And I'll show you that in a minute. All right. So what is this P-I-E-E-I-R? Okay. Well, we said earlier that the E in here, the E, that's this uh, voltage. Now I kept this, I kept this uh, problem up here from earlier because we're going to use this to kind of show uh, some of these relationships. Although I'm going to delete the capacitance and inductance for simplicity's sake today. Okay. All right, so we, have, we talked about the E, all right? The I is your current, right? Which is represented in amps, ampere, okay? R is the resistance, right? E is the voltage. Now, what about P? What's P? Power, power all right? And what's the unit of measure for power? Uh, amps, or volts. Next one? <laughs> what? Yeah, you got it, all right. Watts, okay? Power is represented by watts. And so a watt, all right, is effectively one volt pushing one amp and the load being one ohm of resistance. It has to work out like that for the formula to work out. That's, that's one way to think about it. And the book actually talks about it like that. Um, but the watt is the actual work being done or the, the power is the, the amount of, I don't know if work is the best way to put it, but... Um, it is the, the power consumed by one volt pushing one amp, all right? So these four things right here are really just the meat and potatoes, of everything we're going to do mathematically, okay? So now, can you give me a different, now just looking at these two, give me a different formula other than these two, but it's using one of those two, right? Kind of get where I'm going with that? Yeah. All right, give me another one. So... E, say that again? E divided by P equals I, or I divided by P equals E. Okay, so back to the algebra piece of this. All right, what we're going to do is we're just going to manipulate variables around the equation to show some different relationships. Okay, so if P equals I times E, then I equals P over E. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, all I did is I divided both sides by E, canceled that, and I'm left with that. 
Okay, that's one variant. Okay, now what about this? How do I solve for i here? Well, that, you know, same thing. So if I divide both sides by r, cancels that out, and I'm left with i equals e over r. Cool. So now when we're looking at those, those, that cool table that shows all those different formulas and stuff, uh, you shouldn't have to look at a table to figure that out, right? That's like seconds of algebra. And, and coming to this course, you should have had some type of algebra. It's like a warrant officer requirement or something. So uh, you shouldn't have a problem moving the E around the I around the R, right? So those are pretty simple. But what about substitution? We're going to see some other ones, some like power calculations. And uh, what's another? Do you, can you remember off the top of your head without looking at that, some other uh, variants of a power calculation? There's one in particular that uses squares. Remember that one? Okay, well, let's, let's look at this. So let's say if E equals IR, I'm going to write it over here. So if P equals IE and E equals IR, well, what if we substituted this into here? What do we get? P equals I times, now we're substituting because E equals IR, so that means that's IR, so that's times I times R. Or commonly referred, you hear people say I squared R. The square, the superscript, indicating that it's that variable times itself. All right. Well, we could do the same thing. So let's solve for I. We did that over here, and we said that I equals E over R. So now let's say P equals IE, and now we're going to substitute in if I equals E over R, and we substitute that in for that, what are we left with? P equals what? E squared over R. Okay. All right, and those are just some, some <laughs> varied things on moving the E around the I around the R. All right, you hear me commonly refer to that, all right? It's just simple, simple algebra. You don't need to memorize a chart, nor should you have to look at some chart that just shows a triangle with a P and an I and an E or an E and an I and an R. That's not science. Science is that formula, all right? And so if you remember those two formulas and you just stay a little okay with algebra, that's all you need is those right there. Now I'm going to show you through here, through the problem that we had kind of worked out demonstrating on the Lab Bolt intro, and we'll see if all of this you know, hoobity boobity, right? Math and science actually works out to what we actually measured in our lab bolt lab intro. All right, so you'll remember Mr. Schwab that we had hooked up that one circuit that was 300 ohms. We had a source voltage of 124 volts. The resistance was 300 ohms. And we measured our current to be 0 0.417 amps, right? Okay, well, let's pretend that... Uh, we don't know what the resistance value is, okay? Let's just say we were looking at our screen over there and the screen said 124 volts is E1 and uh, current I1 was 0 0.4, what do we got? 17. All right, well, back to Ohm's law, there's this, this guy named, you know, German guy, something Ohm something, right? It's in the reading. It's probably not important in the grand scheme of science, but uh, so don't focus on that when you're doing the reading too much, but that's the, the origins of ohm. All right, so if E equals IR, right? And we're gonna solve for R because let's just assume we don't know that value, okay? And you'll be kind of surprised when we actually calculate it out, uh, what it actually is. Okay, so I'm gonna take, now I wanna isolate that R. So we do that through algebra. Right? Divide both sides by I to get the uh, R by itself. So we get E over I equals R. Yeah, yeah? You got your calculator handy on your cell phone? All right, so we're going to do E equals 124 volts and I equals 0 0.417. So 124 volts divided by 0 0.417 amps equals, what do we got? 297.3. 297.36? Mm, yeah. All right. And that's ohms, right? Mm -hmm. All right, 297.36, so about 297 ohms. Well, that's three ohms different than what that thing says. 
oh my goodness, right? Well, this isn't super precision um, stuff going on rocket ships or anything. So now I'm a little confused because that says 300. This science you just told me about says that should give me exactly what it is. Uh, let's actually measure it. Let's measure it. You remember how to do that? Yeah. All right, cool. So uh, come on up. Let's, see. let's measure. We had this one switch here on the resistive load module flipped up that indicates 300 ohms. So just grab two. We're just going to use the fluke for this. Yeah. One, okay. And one of the cool things about these banana plugs is, is you see the fluke has these these leads with the little needles on it, but you can also plug our lab volt cables directly into the banana jacks and measure resistance that way. Nope, we're just gonna measure the resistance across here. So just put one up to there. All right, bring that into here. Doesn't matter which one, one of these two. All right, now the other one to the common. And into there. All right, now flip us over to the ohm. Now the ohm reading on the Fluke 87 is right at the top, all right? And you'll notice it by the little horseshoe. All right, so what are we reading? 299.2, uh, so it's not exactly 300, okay? Obviously it's not super precise equipment, all right? What did we calculate? We calculated 297.34, uh, but we're there, we're in the ballpark. That relationship exists, okay? So now, what I'm gonna show you is we're gonna see if this holds true. All right, so what is this one right here? That's 100 ohms, right? All right, so we're gonna talk here in a little bit about determining equivalent resistances in parallel circuits. But for right now, I know that if I flip <coughs> this switch right here, it's actually gonna be a 600 ohm and a 300 ohm resistor in parallel, which is gonna end up having an equivalent resistance of 200 ohms. We're gonna put a pin in that and come back and I'll explain that later. All right, but just know that if I flip these two switches, that should be 200 ohms. Now let's verify with our meter that we got down here, 1.99, yeah, yeah. All right, so now, now we'll call this circuit two. All right, we should still have the 124 volts. Now our resistance should be 200 ohms. Let me, oh, that drew ugly. All right, so if we hook this up to our lab bolt system, now, because the science should hold true, what should our current be then? Point six two. Okay. How did you get that? Uh, one point four e divided by r. E divided by r. Okay. Let's let's base this out. E equals i r, and now we're looking for the i, so we're going to divide both sides by r. Cancel that out. So e over r equals i which is 124 volts divided by 200 ohms. And what did that come out to be? 0 0.62 amps, right? Okay, well, let's build it. Let's see, all right? Now, you'll notice a common theme as we go through this, all right? You're going to get some lecture. We're going to talk some science. And then you're going to go experiment doing labs, all right? And the labs are going to be this full circle swing <coughs> where it's going to walk you through every possible variant of how you could calculate this. And by the time you get to the end, you're going to be like, I did all that just to prove that? Well, yeah, because the whole premise behind all of this is comparing theoretical, which is what we just talked about, this e equals IR stuff, so theoretical, to experimentational, which is, or experimental, which is what we're doing over here, and analyzing those two results. And are they always going to be perfect? Well, no, because... Maybe on paper it says 120 volts, and on here it says 300 ohms, but in reality, we're getting you know, 199.3, and our voltage coming out of here is actually 124.4, and we're rounding every now and then. And, and those rounding conventions that we use end up translating to little degrees off. The thing that's always going to hold true, though, is those proportional relationships between voltage and current. So in E equals IR, so what do we do here? So on our first one, we had... 300 ohms, right? And we had 0.4 amps, right? All with the same voltage. So now I'm lowering my resistance by adding that one in there, right? I flip the switch and now I'm at 200 ohms. Well, if voltage is the same and equal I holds true, if I lower the resistance, what has to happen in order for that relationship to maintain consistency? If E stays the same, resistance drops, what does the current have to do? It has to raise by the same proportionality 
that the resistance dropped because those two at the end of the day all have to equal that E. And that's, that's Ohm's law. Well, now we're proving it, all right? So what we're going to do now, can you grab some leads? Um, I don't know. I like to just grab a handful. And so right now I'm going to pull my meters back up. All right, I still got E1 and I1 going here. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to hook this circuit back up, but now instead of using the 300 ohms like we did before, we're going to add that extra resistor and then uh, use and see what our actual current readout is. All right, so I'm going to still use this variable one. So I'm going to go from here. Where should I put this based on my circuit up there? It's going to go through the resistor. Through what? How is it based on my I1. to I1? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Now, where to next? So, the neutral. Okay. And that should, uh, come up here. Nope. Can go to your resistor. Can, it can. Yep. All right. So now we can leave this. This is just a parallel thing here that we're just adding another meter in it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn this to voltage. We don't want to be measuring resistance while we're hotting up the circuit. So um, we'll just digitally meter the voltage there. All right, so top of the resistor. Yep, exactly. So now what that did is that created that series connection between here and completed the circuit. Last step, we actually already have it by having that right there, but we'll go ahead and do it in here like so. All right, so. All right, coming back down to, I'm going to follow this note up so I don't have to take it all the way back to there. And then, I can't see. Oh, and then that up to there, over to E1, voila, spider's nest. Okay, so all this fancy stuff that we did, we essentially just hooked this up, just like so, right? So we've got these two switched up, so now 200 ohms. We did the calculations and we see that we should be getting 0.62 amps? Correct. Correct. Okay. All right. So let's hot it up. Let's turn this bad boy all the way up. All right. What are we reading? 0.623. 0.623. 123 0.9. 0.623. All right. So we just proved Ohm's law, right? That proportional relationship, we lowered the resistance and the current bumped up because the voltage stayed the same. Now, I guess you could argue if you were really analytical that, wow, that says 120. Oh, now it says 124 again. All right, but it said 123.9. Uh, these are all incremental uh, adjustments that are making very minute differences um, in your overall equation. So don't wrap yourself around that axle. Just know that by the same percentage that resistance dropped, that current had to increase to maintain that voltage. Now, conversely, if I reduce the amount of current well let's we, we're going to do it by resistance that's how we're affecting how much current we don't have a dial dialing up and down the current so resistance is the thing that's causing us or voltage so now in this case if resistance stays the same and we dial the voltage down what's going to happen to the current it should essentially lower correct exactly right so let's try it out all right so right now we're at 123 volts and we're at 0 0.623 let's go to 50 percent so if we lower the voltage by 50 percent what should our current be? Should be half of that. Half of that, right? Because it has to it has to maintain that same proportionality. It's science. Right? So let's dial it down to 50. And where are we at? We're right there. We're about half. Okay? Now again, this isn't super precise on this needle right here, so I might not be exactly. Let me dial that up to right at 60. And actually it needs to be, we were at 124, so we should be at 62 to be exactly. Let me see if I can get it there. It's pretty close. 0.31. So notice, we dropped the voltage by exactly 50%, and just like you deduced, the current has to drop by 50%. We didn't even need to measure it, but we did, so we could prove science, right? It's awesome. Okay. Well, man, that's it. That's all you need to know. Eight weeks done, right? Go forth, right? No. That's just one cool aspect to it. All right. So let's disassemble our circuit. Actually, we'll leave it up. We'll leave it up. Okay. All right. So... That's really the fundamental building block behind everything that we're going to be doing is Ohm's law. All right, Ohm's law. And as we start talking about power, 
that P equals IE calculation. And it's going to get a little bit more tricky because the P equals IE and just IE only applies to just simple DC circuits. Now when we start talking about AC and that phase shift that we talked about in the intro, that creates what's called a power factor, which will then in turn create some variances in power, but we're going to get to that later. All right, but for right now, P equals IE, E equals IR, and that's it. All right, so now let's backtrack to what was going on here. Now let me disassemble this. I should have gone ahead and done that. Let me take all this off. And this is my lab partner over here, so he can fix that. All right, and you say, well, how on earth, if you had a 300 and a 600 over here, did you get 200 ohms as your equivalent resistance? Okay, and so with that being said, the term equivalent resistance. Equivalent resistance, and in further days when we talk about equivalent inductance and equivalent capacitance, is the actual summative resistance that a circuit sees with all the different elements within the circuit. Okay, now here, <coughs> I'm gonna draw R1, a little exploded view of R1. here, here, and here. Okay, so based on our previous <coughs> lecture, right, are those three resistors in series or in parallel? What do you think? In they're in parallel. Why are they in parallel? What's a good quick indicator that you can use to see that they're in parallel? Because they're all going to the same nodes. Right, they share the same nodes. The same two ends are the same nodes. All of them are in parallel, right? So again, back to the color coding idea. If we were to color the nodes, this is all one node right here. See how that's all electrically that same thing? This is all electrically that same thing. I'll leave it blue. We can look at those and see that all three of those resistors share the same two nodes. That means that they are parallel. Okay, so now all of these resistors down here on a resistive bank are the same values. You'll, you'll get to know them well. 300 ohms, 600 ohms, and 1200 ohms. Okay, all right, so now I'm gonna draw this a little bit different, okay? So this is series, I mean parallel. I'm gonna draw series resistors, which could be if I was to turn one of these on and then wire it in line with this one, turn one of those on and then wire it in line with this one and turn it on, okay? And then maybe that looks like, we'll do it down here. R1. R2 and R, oh goodness, R3, okay, like so. All right, so now these, how are these configured? Those are in R2. Those are in series, right? And so equivalent resistance, if I was to try and figure out what is the overall resistance in this circuit, how we have it wired, let me, let me do this right here so you can see that we're actually going to be measuring between there, okay? Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set both of these up right here. I'm going to run you through the math, and then we're going to test it in real life and see, you know, how that comes out. Okay, so I don't have to do anything to this to create this, right? This is already set up like that, right? Well, I'm going to, let's say, I'm going to put these two in series, all right? So really... All I have to do is connect two points on it, assuming this is just one resistor here, and we'll say the 300 and the 600, okay? And that's the same thing. So now if I measured across these two points, effectively, I have this. Now R1 equals what? 600? 600. 600 R2 equals 300 ohms. All right, now over here, I'm only going to turn these two on, just like our example, so we can actually just erase this 1200 one because I'm going to leave that switch open. And I'm just going to do this. Okay, so parallel series. All right, do you happen to remember from way back in the, the deep realms of our intricate phase three we had on equivalent resistances? 
because we probably didn't learn it. All right, so to calculate the equivalent resistance of a series circuit, it is very, very simple. It is simply the sum of all resistances in that circuit. Very, very simple, right? Okay, so one symbol that we're going to use a lot is R sub EQ. And you'll see as the course progresses, there's a lot of these that are going to have subscripts, right? So it's R with the subscript indicating what is the R. So if I had like R sub 1 or R sub 2, well, that just means resistance of 1, resistance of 2. If I had V sub R1, V sub R2, well, that's just saying the voltage across R1 or the voltage across R2, blah, blah, blah. Okay. All right. So if REQ of a series circuit, so let's say series REQ equals R1 plus R2 plus dot, 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 R to the N, which just means however many resistors you have, you just keep on adding them up. Okay. So what is our equivalent resistance of this circuit right here then? 600 plus 300, right? So R E Q equals 600 ohms plus 300 ohms equals 900 ohms. Cool. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. It's in the context of what we're doing, right? But for right now, let's just, let's think science. Okay. Well, this is a little bit more complicated. Okay. Let me see if I can find one of these handy dandy TI calculators around here so I can show you the buttons. Here we go. All right. Okay. Parallel circuits, a little trickier. Okay. Instead of the sum of this, it's the inverse of the sum of all that. Right? So that means for parallel, two R's or one R in parallel? What do you think? Two? two? That doesn't look right. <laughs> I'm just going to erase it. We're going to do this symbol. That means parallel. All right. So it's the inverse of this formula, which means 1 over REQ equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus dot, 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 1 over R to the N. Okay, so what that means is that, now you got to pay attention to this, all right, because in your head right now, you're already cooking, right, and you're going, okay, well, that just 1 over 300 plus 1 over 600. Well, if I get, you know, common denominators and all that good stuff, well, that's what, 3 over 600? Yeah, did I do that right? If I take uh, 1 over 300, get a common denominator times 2, that's 2 over 300, 2 over 600 plus 1 over 600, so it's 3 over 600. You, you follow me? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, is the answer 3 over 600? No, it's the inverse. Okay, so what that means is, so 1, one over REQ equals 1 over 600, plus 1 over 300. Okay, so 1 over REQ equals 3 over 600. Okay. All right. So is my answer 3 divided by 600? It, it, it can be. 3 divided by 600 is 200. 3 divided by 600? 600 divided by 300. 600 divided by 3. What did, I, what did you just do in your head there? Inverse. You inversed them, right? <laughs> so the inverse is the answer. Okay? So I'm going to show you a real... So what that means is, is you could take this thing, and then you could divide 3 by 600, and then hit the inverse button on your calculator. Or you could know that you're going to inverse it in your head, and so you just divide 600 by 3. All right, but I'm going to show you the easy way of doing this. All right. So on our calculators, we have this 1 over x button. All right, the 1 over x button is the inverse button, okay? So the way I teach people, the, the, the simplest way of, it, sometimes it's just about building that battle rhythm and pattern of how you use your instruments. It's going to, you know, kind of get you through it. So I take 600, because that's my first resistor, then I hit the inverse button, plus 300, hit the inverse button, equals 0.005, right? Then I hit the inverse button one last time, 200, all right? So... The inverse, the sum of the inverse is inverse, right? So it's inverse, inverse, and then inverse your resultant, and then you get the answer, okay? So when we did that, what did we come up with? 200 ohms, right? Okay, so I took the same resistance values, same resistor values, wired them two different ways. I wired two resistors in parallel and two resistors in series. Now the difference is, if I wired them in parallel, that's a much lower number than if I had them in series. Am I right? 
much lower. So that's why it's important to know and understand how wiring configurations, whether they're series or parallel, has different effects on the circuit, okay? Which, just spitballing based on our previous discussion, if our circuit saw these two different numbers with the same voltage source, which one's gonna have the higher current? Much higher, right? You know, almost by a factor of what, you know, four point something or what, you know? Um, so that's why it's important because now the current is going to be much higher. Also, it's going to be important because of how current and voltage flow through these different series and parallel circuits, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay. All right. So we did all the math there. We got our hoobity bloobity science, right? Now let's test it out. So come back over here, do the same method. All right. Um, get, you can use, uh, yeah, 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 you can grab two more leads. Now I just want you to measure the resistance between here. And then also separately measure the resistance here. And we'll see, because this is the equivalent of this. And that is the equivalent of that. Let's just confirm our, our uh, crazy science with actual real measurements. All right, so here's a cool thing. What does that say? What's the second part of that though? Because initially you see 0.897 and you're like, oh, oh that thousand. seems off. What? Yeah, you got the K, right? The K. That means kilo, which means times 10 to the third. So if I was just using ohms, if I just said ohms, how many is it? 0.897. Ohms or kilo ohms? Kilo ohms. Which is how many ohms? 897. 897 ohms, all right? Which, based on our math, we did what? 900? So that's like within two, three ohms of what we're supposed to get. Same as this one. Yep, exactly, right? Which goes back to the point of the amount of resistances these are. These aren't super precise resistors, all right? There's a certain tolerance resistors can have, especially if you buy the cheap ones, uh, that's not going to be exactly what the nameplate says. Per the nameplate, it should be 300, 600, 1200, but in reality, we're going to see different variances, right? Okay, so if we were to add one more resistor to that, Right? And we added the 1200 to that. What should our equivalent resistance be? Uh, 1200, 23, or 20. Wow, let me do math here. <laughs> 2100, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. All right. All right. Keep on going. Okay. <laughs> All right. You can edit that one out. Yeah. <laughs> Keep that one in there. Keep that one in there. Okay. In order to do that, I'm going to pop this over to here. Give me one more. Oh, I got a yellow right here. Now I'm going to pop this in series with this one, and I'm going to add the 1200. All right, so what do we got? 2.1 kilo ohms. 2100, right? So we just proved the science, which leads me to one other thing. We're going to talk, you're going to be seeing a lot of prefixes throughout the course in this science. That was the first one. K equals kilo equals times 10 to the third. M equals, what do you think? Mega <laughs> times 10 to the sixth. There's the next one that's a G. You know what a G is? Gigawatts. Huh? No, that's a real thing. It's not just from Back to the Future. All right. So then, conversely, we can go the other way. You're going to see also, you're going to see little m. Notice that's big M. This is little m, which what do you think that stands for? Milli. Yep. You're right, okay, and what is milli? Times 10 to the negative three, okay? And then we're gonna see this cool little symbol here, the little, it's actually called mu, right? Not the Pokemon, but mu, all right, which stands for times 10 to the negative six, micro, okay? And you'll actually see these prefixes in your, in your measuring instruments a lot of times too, all right? So if, you just read uh, 0.897 kilo ohms. Well, that's the equivalent of 897 ohms, all right? So now if I was to just move this decimal three places, right, because kilo is times 10 to the three, all right, that makes this 0, .0 or I'm sorry, nine, 897 ohms. You're going to see this convention back and forth, and a lot of times the instruments will bounce and they'll give you that prefix. You got to pay attention to it. It's 
you don't pay attention to the prefix, you're going to go, oh, I got 2.1 ohms, something's off. Well, it's because you didn't read that little letter right there next to the little ohm symbol and it says kilo. Okay, cool. So we proved that our parallel or our series circuit works, right? All right, so let's, uh, let's pull this out. Here's our metering device. And now we're going to go back to our parallel circuit. All right, we did the math on that one up here, right? And we said the inverse of the inverse is, the inverse of that is going to give us 200 ohms, right? All right, so now we can come back up here. And we're going to measure this. Notice there's no power going through any of this. The way that this actually works is you're measuring the resistance with there's no power to it. The multimeter itself is creating a tiny micro bit of current, just enough so it can measure resistance within that circuit, okay? Which is also why it's important, don't do it while it's energized. All right, so right now, goodness gracious. All right, we're seeing 1.2 kilo ohms, right? It's because I got this 1200 ohm resistor on. But now if we want to test that, now we're seeing OL, out of limits, all right? That just means it's an open circuit. I'm gonna flip these two, which is this right here. And we're getting the 1.99.4, which is the 200, right? Okay, now I want you to use this calculator and do it like I just showed you, all right? And tell me if I was to bring this down here, add that 1200 ohm resistor to the 600, to the 300, what should my equivalent resistance be? Remember, one over X. Again, the button on the calculator, your friend, one over X. That's the inverse. Give it a couple minutes and let's see. We need to phone a friend. All right. All right. Cool. You had to hit it one more time. You had to hit the inverse button one more time. All right. So I'm going to show this again. Can you zoom in on the calculator? Are you able to see it? So you can just like watch my fingers work magic on this calculator. All right. So we've got three resistors, 1,200, 600, 300. So what I do is I'll do 1,200. Oh, yeah. 1,200. Inverse button plus 600 inverse button plus 300 inverse button equals, and I'm left with this number right here and I'm gonna inverse that and I get 171.4, all right? You know how I know it's right? Because I've done these labs a lot of times and I know that if you flip those three and calculate it out, it's 171 ohms, all right? So the equivalent resistance is 171 ohms if we have all three of these switch together okay so let's test it we got 199 showing there because we just had the 600 and 200 flip the switch what are we at 171 science right so awesome okay all right cool so equivalent resistances again parallel series circuits all pretty simple the parallel one's a little trickier because you know it's uh you got to do inverse buttons you know it can be it can be tricky but what if we have series parallel what if we have a circuit that uh, has everything in it, right? Let's erase all of this. All right, I'm gonna leave that there like that. Now, what if I did this? Okay, and I call this one R1, 1200. R2, 600, R3, 300. Okay, so what kind of circuit is this? What do you think there, Dan? Which one? This, this, the whole thing, what is it? What do you think? Series and parallel? Series and parallel. Also referred to as series parallel, all right? So how would you go about solving that? What do you think? If we're looking for a requ a requ <laughs> equivalent resistance, R, EQ, all right, what do you think? What would your, be your plan of attack here? <clears throat> Solve the uh, series first and then get to the parallel. 
Absolutely, right? Because that's, that's really kind of easy, right? So let's solve the series ones first. Well, we can see that there is, these two aren't sharing the same node, and they have one node in between them that has no other branches, so we know that's a series circuit. All right, so we're going to simplify these two into, what, 900, right? 600 plus 300, so 900 ohms. Well, one way to keep track of all this is now I can simplify the circuit in my drawing by going over to here, R1, which is 1,200. Now I only have one equivalent resistance there. That is 900. And that's parallel because they share the same two nodes. So now we're going to go back through that formula that we had. The inverse of the inverse is inverses. All right, so 1 over REQ. You can do the calculations while I'm writing. 1 over 1,200 plus 1 over 900 equals. It's going to be 500 and something. 514? What is it? 514.28 ohms. Cool. Let's build it and let's see. Okay. So I have two in pair, or I have two in series. So we'll go back to our configuration over here. Those two are in series, which is a 600 and a 300. We're still there. Now we're going to turn all these off except the 1200, right? And we are going to put this in parallel with the, okay, so we're going to go here to here. Actually, we'll go here to here. And here to here. Let me see if I got that right. All right. That's in parallel with that. Show enough. Okay, so if we measure our resistance across here and here. What do we got? 514.4. Can you zoom in on the multimeter? Because it's pretty awesome. It's science. Right? So, cool. Cool story. So we talked about parallel circuits, equivalent resistance. We talked about series circuits, equivalent resistance. And then we talked about series parallel circuits. Cool. Is that it? How much time do I got left? About five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. All right, so before I go into uh, Kirchhoff's loss, uh, we'll recap on this one. All right, now the main components of electrical science, right, the main units that we talk about is voltage indicated with an E or a V if you're me, right? And that's that push, that's that PSI from the water system. Then we got current, which is the water, right? That's the actual thing flowing out to the end users. And then we've got resistance denoted by R or ohms, that little uh, upside down Greek horseshoe. And that is the resistance and the opposition to current flow. All right, and again, you can think back to that little cartoon that I have in the slideshow that shows the guy with the lasso choking up on the other dude who's trying to get through the pipe and then you got voltage back there pushing the dude through the pipe. All right, the guy pushing the guy through the pipe, that's the voltage. The guy getting choked up, that's the current. And the dude with the lasso pulling, that's the resistance, okay? Then we also talked about power, all right, which is watts which we're going to get into in the next lecture a little bit, and how we actually calculate the equivalent resistances. So again, one more again for series circuits, REQ equals R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus dot, 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 dot R to the N. Well, what if I only have two resistors? Well, then you can't add R3, right? Just R1 plus R2. The sum of the resistances in the circuit, and that's if it's series. Now, if it's parallel, it's 1 over REQ plus 1 over R1, oh, I'm sorry, equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3 plus that, 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 1 over REQ. And again, our friend in this is understanding how to use our calculator because that 1 over X button is our friend, okay? So, that's the inverse button. You can do it however you want to do it, however your mind simplifies the circuit, but I think personally the inverse button is the simplest way. Um, one last thing to note, a good quick way to know if you've actually solved the circuit right or not, okay? 
in a parallel circuit, all right, your equivalent resistance is always going to be lower than the lowest resistor in that circuit, okay? Always going to be lower. So if we had a 200 and a 600, your equivalent resistance should be under that 200 ohms. If you've got something above 200 ohms, automatically right off the bat, you did the math wrong, okay? Series is the opposite. You're always going to have a higher resistance than the lowest resistor, right? So if you have a 200 and a 600 and your equivalent resistance came out to 171 and they're in series, well, you did the math wrong because you have to add the two together. So it has to be higher than that less, okay? So those are two quick ways to uh, quickly identify, again, keeping track of nodes so you understand which ones are parallel and which ones are series and paying attention to how to use your calculator and which units are what, again, Remember to mark your units. See? Ohms, ohms, ohms. All right. Well, next we're going to go into Kirchhoff's voltage and current laws and do some power stuff. So get ready.